Welcome and thanks for joining me for Two Steps Forward, our daily Bible study. Uh, my name is James and absent today for this episode is my wife, Adrian. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to record uh, with me for this opportunity, uh, which is real unfortunate because it's episode 350. So we've reached another milestone there and uh, thankful for that. And I promise it'll just be an episode this time. She'll be back for our next one. But we are up to episode 350, Daniel chapter 9. Again, the second half of the book of Daniel is wild apocalyptic stuff. It reads almost exactly like the book of Revelation in many respects, except the interesting thing is Revelation is obviously a distant future from about 100 AD when John is receiving the, the his revelation. Uh, the revelations that are given to Daniel are generally speaking leading up to the first century AD um, and the fulfillment found at the temple and in the person of Jesus Christ and in the um, intermediate uh, kingdoms and years in between the intertestamental period that we sometimes refer to. Um, his his visions generally fit into those types of things. So we're still working our way through them. Uh, Daniel 9, we get into a prayer uh, from Daniel and the 77s we'll address in this chapter and what exactly that means. So if you haven't done so yet, please pause right now and read through Daniel chapter 9. But here is my personal summary. In the first year of the reign of Darius the Mede, so again, we're looking around 539 B.C., Daniel recognized from Jeremiah's prophecy that the ruin of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So he's been studying uh, that exilic prophet, Jeremiah, and understands, uh, it's mentioned a couple different times, 70 years as the time of captivity. Daniel turns to God in prayer and fasting and in mourning, and he prays something like this. He confesses, Lord, we have sinned against your laws and not listened to your prophets uh, Lord, you are righteous, but we are covered in shame. We are receiving the punishment that we deserve, but we ask you for forgiveness. Have mercy on us and your city, Jerusalem, not because of our own righteousness, but because of your mercy. Uh, and then Daniel says that he, while he was still praying, the angel Gabriel again came to him at the time of the evening sacrifice. And Gabriel said that Daniel's prayers had been heard. He said that the that 77s have been decreed to put an end to sin. Uh, from the time the word goes out to restore Jerusalem until the, the anointed one comes, there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. Jerusalem will be rebuilt, though there will be opposition. And after the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be put to death. The end will come like a flood and in the middle of a final seven a ruler will put an end to sacrifice and offering. At the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end. We've seen that phrase a couple times now uh, and referred to it in a prior episode, but um, that is Daniel chapter 9. So the devotional thoughts for today then are this. Number one, the consequence of sin and 70 years of captivity. Okay, so... Darius the Mede began his rule uh, around 539 BC when Babylon fell to Medo-Persia. We're told in the opening verses that Daniel had been reading from the prophet Jeremiah. And specifically, if you want to look this up, it's Jeremiah 25 and 29 where we get these references to the 70 years. Uh, depending when you start counting the 70 years indicates when it ends too then obviously and different it, it could be a couple of different things for starters around 605 606 bc that's when we have the babylonians first coming in and fighting the southern kingdom of judah and deporting some of the exiles like daniel and his friends jerusalem the city that hasn't fallen at that point but the israelites are starting to become defeated so from 606 BC, if you go ahead 70 years, you get the time of the Medo-Persians. So 536 BC, uh, the Medo-Persians coming in and defeating the Babylonians. That might be the 70-year period. However, you could also argue that from the time of the destruction of the city of Jerusalem, which is usually Jerusalem is sacked 586 BC, if you move forward 70 years from there, uh, you get to about 516 BC and 516 BC would be roughly the time when you are getting the so rebuilding not only of Jerusalem but specifically of the second temple's dedication time. And so this 
this explains part of the reason why, you know, Daniel doesn't know exactly when this 70 year period is going to end because you don't know exactly when you're going to what's the starting date is to be looking for. But he's looking forward to it and he's praying for this. And, uh, you know, symbolically, what's happening in that 70 years, we learn, is that the 70 years that the Israelites are in captivity are the product of the Israelites' failure to obey the Sabbath years and the years of Jubilee. So if you go back to Leviticus chapter 25, what you find is that the Israelites were not only supposed to rest themselves, but they were supposed to allow the land to rest by God's command. So every seventh year was a Sabbath year, and every 50th year there was uh, seven seventies excuse me, seven sevens. So seven years of, uh, seven times of seven years gives you 49 years. The 50th year is a year of Jubilee. And there were special things that were canceled and land restored to a family and stuff like that. Uh, at that point, the problem is we don't actually have any record of the Israelites doing this in the old Testament, obeying God's command specifically here. And then when you get to second Chronicles chapter 36, verses 20 to 21, it says during the 70 years of captivity, the land enjoyed its rest. Um, again, the math is a little bit tricky, but if the idea is that the 70 years in captivity, are the result of a failure to honor the Sabbath years and the Jubilee years. You put it all together, 70 years in captivity when God is now giving uh, these, uh, now giving the land rest, he's collecting on those 70 years that weren't given up, means that would have required a period of about 450 years of not practicing Sabbath years or Jubilee years. I think the bigger point that like, okay, that the math is tricky on all this. What, is, what does it mean for us though? I think the point is that God always collects. Like if God says something is going to happen, you're going to take a Sabbath year. You're either going to take it voluntarily or you're going to take it non-voluntarily. But God's word is always going to be proven in the end. And what that means for us is when God tells us something is good, we either submit to that voluntarily or eventually we'll submit to it involuntarily or not by choice. Uh, an example of this, uh, potentially would be uh, your health. If you don't ever take a day off, if you don't ever go on vacation, if you don't, uh, not only do we know that there are diminishing returns from a research standpoint for people who are working constantly because the body can only go so hard for so long, but oftentimes you will land uh, with an ulcer or um, a heart attack or something like that because you're just not taking care of yourself. Because the body needs rest. You can't just go relentlessly. Your body is not your own to do with as it please. It pleases. You have to give it rest. That's a, the, the end result of an ulcer or the end result of a, an emotional breakdown or a heart attack sometimes is the natural consequence of failing to recognize that you have to steward your body. Uh, there's other, I think, natural examples of this. Um, if you don't drink in moderation, if you drink but don't drink in moderation, your liver is going to go out. Why? Because you did not submit to the design God gave you where he said, yes, you can enjoy this, but you can only enjoy it in moderation. You can't abuse it. Same thing is true. Smoking would be another obvious example. Like, is there an outright biblical command against smoking? No, but we do have to steward our bodies. And we do know that the long-term research on it is undeniably that it leads to things like cancer, like like lung cancer and esophageal cancer and stuff like that. So if you disobey the design that God has given to your body and you disobey his command to take care of your body, there are inevitable consequences attached to these things. This is true psychologically and emotionally too. Um, If I would look at the bitterness that exists in my life, where does it come from? God has told me to forgive others. Uh, as he has forgiven me, if I choose not to, and I'm like, no, they need to be brought to justice and I won't rest until they're brought to justice, they're, I'm probably not hurting that other person. The only person that's really getting hurt, the consequence of that failure to forgive is a consequence of bitterness that exists in my life. Um, for that matter, anxiety. Um, When God tells us that he's sovereign over all things and he's in control, if I don't trust God's promises, which is sinful, a lack of faith is sinful. If I don't trust his promises, I'm going to have heightened levels of anxiety. And interestingly, the counterintuitive thing about that is it, it can actually weaken you in many ways. Not only is it unenjoyable, but for instance, if I stress out about getting sick, 
one of the things I learned as somebody with obsessive compulsive disorder who was always stressed about getting sick and contamination and stuff like that is by constantly worrying about it, it diminishes your immune system. And so counterintuitively, as I was worrying about being sick, it was actually making me more susceptible to becoming sick. Why? It's a natural consequence of failing to obey what God tells you to obey or believe what God tells you to believe. Okay. So these are the consequences of sin that the Israelites are reaping in captivity. Second devotional thought for the day, uh, the power of one man's prayer. So it seems to be that Daniel's prayer is the catalyst for Israel's exile deliverance. And this is interesting because the, the New Testament book of James says the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. And we actually, James isn't saying that in a vacuum. He's saying it in light of the history of the Israelites. So for instance, when uh, the nation of Israel was, God said he was just going to destroy them because he was so fed up with them. Moses intercedes with prayer and God relents. The prayer of one man uh, helped stave off the punishment for an entire nation worth of people. A uh, similar thing happens, uh, for instance, with Elijah, when the nation is not faithful and God allows a uh, drought in the land. When Elijah prays for rain, then God brings about rain for the prayer of one righteous man, uh, brings about blessing for an entire nation's worth of people. Uh, King Jehoshaphat has a prayer um, at one point in Second Chronicles 20 where he, uh, it helps stave off the invading Moabites and the Ammonites. Uh, King Hezekiah has kind of a famous prayer. Um, in It's mentioned in Isaiah 37 and 2 Kings 19 where the Assyrian army is invading uh, the Israelites and he prays to God and there is an angel that comes and slays 185,000 uh, soldiers of the Assyrians. Again, the prayer of one righteous man is powerful and effective. And the lesson we learn is God doesn't have to have to wait for an entire nation to repent. He would prefer it. But sometimes God reacts on behalf of one person within a larger group praying for that group. Now, the question in the application is, what groups are you part of that you probably should be praying for more frequently? And I want you to think in a couple different ways. It could be like um, from a citizen standpoint. So it could be your city. Do you pray regularly for your city? It could be your state. There are certain there are certain legislation factors that affect your state. Do you pray for it regularly? Uh, it could be for your nation, like the United States of America or otherwise. Uh, it could be for your local church or your church body or the entire church on earth. But the point is that uh, humbly, we should, we're not only supposed to our pray, pray, we're supposed to also, yeah, we, we pray for ourselves, but we're supposed to pray for uh, also our enemies. But yes, the larger groups that we're part of, and God will bless those groups on the power of one righteous prayer. One righteous person's prayer is powerful and effective. And if we believe that, we're going to pray for the larger body. Third devotional thought. Uh, wild, I'm just going to call it wild prophetic interpretation. Uh, this prophecy, I think it's important to keep in mind as we're going through interpreting prophecies. Uh, some of them seem to be a larger group of people. Uh, some of them seem to be uh, an isolated set of circumstances or um, one specific time period. I think we have to be clear to interpret this as the Jewish people because there's this particular prophecy, there, uh, the nation of the Jews is mentioned, the temple is mentioned specifically. Um, I, I think this is very clearly related to the, the time of the Jewish people. Um, so the second thing to keep in mind in this prophecy of the 77s is that the Jewish calendar is largely based on sevens. So not only do you have a seven-day week, which, by the way, we have no um, like lunar or solar reason for a seven-day week. That's entirely comes from scripture. Um, but the Jews based their calendar on seven, seven days in a week, a Sabbath year, as we mentioned earlier, the Jubilee year was uh, seven uh, periods of seven years. So the 50th year, Pentecost is seven weeks after first fruits. Um, it's dur during the seventh month of the year, you have the Feast of Trumpets, you have the Day of Atonement, you have the Feast of Tabernacles. So the concept of the sevens is very important in the Jewish way of thinking. 
Not only that, but depending on which Bible translation you're looking at here, it might uh, use the word weeks or it might uh, there might be a note on it and it says the sevens. So weeks is uh, originally mentioned here, but it's, it's talking about periods of sevens. And therefore, when Gabriel here explains to Daniel about 70 periods of seven years, he's really speaking about 490 years. Furthermore, Gabriel seems to break these 490 years down into smaller chunks of 49 years, 434 years, and seven years. So uh, seven sevens, 42, I think it's 42 sevens, uh, and one set of sevens. The first 49 years, seven sevens, seems to refer to the time when uh, Artaxerxes in 445 BC gives the decree that allows Nehemiah to go and build the walls in Jerusalem, to rebuild, reconstruct Jerusalem. So from the time of the beginning, um, to the time when like this is accomplished, that, that seems to be, uh, so marking from 445 BC. If you add the seven by seven, which is 49 years, and the, I think I said 42 earlier, it's 62 sevens, um, which is, again, getting up to 70 sevens, uh, but seven times 62 is then 434. So if you're adding the 49 and the 434, you get to 483, roughly, solar years, uh, if my math is right on that. So at 445, when Artaxerxes gives the decree that Nehemiah can go back and rebuild Jerusalem, is if that's the actual starting date, um, when you push forward 483 years, you actually get into around 30 A.D., Okay, wait a second. This is not only the time of Jesus' ministry, but that would be the time when, in this vision, the anointed one is put to death. Um, interestingly enough, within the next 30, 40 years, this, the temple in Jerusalem is going to be destroyed, and this is going to put an end to the Judaism as an official religion or a religion of God. That is, it's undeniable. If you said anybody after that, if they're not a Christian, um, you know, so there's that period between when Jesus comes and at what point does every Jew have to convert and recognize Jesus as the Messiah before they no longer could be considered God's child? There's that we kind of weird overlapping period. Well, without any question, it has to end by 70 AD because the temple is destroyed by that point. Um, so that the final question then that we get to is um, Daniel 9, 27, the last verse says, he will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. This is the last of the 70 sevens. In the middle of this seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. Remember, the temple is being destroyed. He's going to put an end to sacrifice and those kinds of offerings. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed uh, is poured out on him. Now, this is actually one of the most challenging verses to interpret it in all of Scripture. The last seven, to some extent, appears to be the Messiah himself. It might not be years, like a year period here. The, this last seven might be the Messiah himself. Uh, namely, that after at the end of the 7 by 7 and the 62 by 7, upon the completed work of the Messiah, there will be an end to sacrifices, an end to offerings at the temple, and the temple will have already become at that point spiritually empty as the curtain gets torn into on Good Friday. And now, and officially, the temple has become an abomination because God doesn't live there anymore. Um, I have to say, like, I want to be perfectly honest with you. When we work through this stuff, there's certain things that I have degrees of confidence upon. I don't know to what exactly my level of confidence is on this exact. This isn't my own interpretation. This is a combination of looking at a number of different Bible commentators over the years on this section. Um, and they are not totally Orthodox Christians are not totally in unison on what exactly this all means. I think that's a fair interpretation and at least one that doesn't contradict the rest of Scripture, though. So um, that's that's where we're going to end it here today. Oh, one final note. I Aid asked a question the other day, and I said we were going to get back to these numbers, um, this, specifically the number that was mentioned, because we're, we're going to do such like calculation in these subsequent chapters that I wanted to save it for here. 
Uh, but what she had asked about in Daniel chapter 8 was the two, 2300 evenings and mornings until the temple gets reconsecrated. Part of the confusion is that sometimes when we're talking about the temple, uh, we're talking about it being rebuilt. Sometimes when the temple gets referenced, it's talking about the abomination that causes desolation in the sense of Antiochus Epiphanes before the Maccabean revolt around 168 BC, setting up the temple in Jerusalem as um, a temple to Zeus before, again, Judas Maccabees and his friends come in and, and overthrow this Syrian king. And sometimes when we talk about the temple, we're talking about its eventual destruction uh, after Jesus' death. So the temple curtain tears in two on Good Friday, and then in 70 AD, it's overrun by the Romans. I don't know that Daniel has a clear understanding of, I, I'm pretty confident he does not have a clear understanding of when this is all happening in human history. And even in retrospect, it's a little bit difficult to tell. But with this particular reference in Daniel chapter 8, so going back to that 2300 evenings and mornings until the temple gets reconsecrated, if you take those evenings and mornings literally, uh, what you come up with for 2300 is a little bit over six years. And what some scholars have landed on is that this refers to the time um, when Antiochus Epiphanes, again, um, around 178 BC, Antiochus Epiphanes, the king of Syria, around the time of the rule of the Greeks, um, starts to torment the Jews until the Maccabean revolt, which is 165 BC. And that total, the time when he starts to the time of the revolt is a little over six years. So that might be the possible interpretation of that, although we don't uh, ultimately know. So that is it for today. A lot of, I, I trust me, I know this stuff is kind of interesting and also very difficult to track and calculate. Um, fortunately, our salvations is not based on being able to pass a test on this. Um, but if it's inspired by the spirit to be in scripture, it has value. It probably held a little bit more value for the people of Jesus day. Um, in the same way that revelation holds more value for us today than this probably. Um, uh, but nonetheless, it's interesting to see how God not only makes promises and he communicates it to his people, but how he reveals it in time. So let's close with prayer. Uh, Lord God, you've revealed so many things to us so clearly. And the things that we don't understand, it's not because they're not clear. It's that our brains are not only fallen, but they're finite. Uh, like they're limited in their capacity to understand. And so while you've communicated amazing truths to us, they're sometimes hard for us to grasp. Let us at least simply get uh, like a doxology out of this, a word of praise that you know what you're doing, that you have forecasted it, that you know where we'll be a thousand years from now, a million years and a billion years from now. Uh, so that means you also know what's going to happen today and tomorrow. We don't have to worry about these things. It is completely under your control and that gives us so much peace and solace. Uh, so as you comfort us, Lord, help us uh, not to worry about these things, but to spend our energy praising and worshiping you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for studying with me today. I will see you next time for Daniel chapter 10.